So today we're very excited again to have Stephen Pine back with us. Stephen, thank you for joining us again, and uh, we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Steve is an emeritus professor at Arizona State University, the author of some 40 books, most dealing with the history of fire, but others with exploration, including ice, how the canyon became grand and Voyager themes summarized and elaborated in the great ages of discovery. So he's here to talk to us about his new book, The Great Ages of Discovery that was just is coming out with Arizona uh, University of Arizona Press, who we thank again for hosting these webinars. And uh, they have a uh, discount that they're offering for off the books at U of A Press that we'll put in the chat as well. But Stephen, thank you so much for joining us again. And I'm going to go hide in the background while you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and always fun to talk about exploration. You know, exploration literature uh, has been a bestseller for hundreds of years now. Uh, throughout Europe uh, and its uh, settlement, uh, excuse me, settlement uh, outliers. And uh, today, though, I'm not, you know, it's always popular. Great stories of adventure, uh, great stories often of endurance, discoveries, um, of amazing, uh, surprising, uh, all kinds of great, you know, conflict character uh, narrative. It's, it's, the, it's the, the basics of, of great literature. What I'm going to offer, though, is something a little bit different, which is uh, a framework for thinking about how exploration got started, uh, how it got institutionalized, how it has uh, ebbed and flowed over the years. So uh, trying to look at some way to introduce why we should even divide up exploration. I mean, at one point, shouldn't, it, shouldn't we just consider it as continuous? So trying to find something that would serve as a kind of index. Um, decided to look at Pacific Islands. Uh, there are problems with other islands, particularly in the Atlantic, because they've discovered, uh, forgotten, rediscovered. It's hard to know when Europeans first found it. But the Pacific is different, beginning with Magellan's voyage. Uh, they began discovering new islands, unknown to Europeans, uh, most of them uh, occupied and known to other people, but not to Europe. And this is what the number of islands looks like, uh, beginning with uh, Magell Magellan, uh, organized here in 50 year blocks. So you can begin to see the early voyages find lots and lots because everything they find is new. And then it begins falling off. And by the beginning of the 18th century, uh, we're down to a, a small number. And one reason is that uh, the purpose of the voyages was to find routes across the Pacific. And once a route was found, there was no reason uh, to keep looking. You'd solve the problem. So new islands come mostly by accident. But if we extend that timeline, something really extraordinary happens. So that there's an uptick in the early half of the 18th century. We start discovering a few more islands, then this enormous explosion in the latter half of the 18th century. All kinds of islands, more islands than were discovered throughout the whole first era um, of discovery. And part of these were finding islands that are not high islands anymore, and they're different. Part of it is because people are looking for islands. They're not just looking for new routes for trade. Um, they are looking for other things. And this continues uh, into the early 19th century and then finally dies out. 1859 uh, Midway is discovered, and that's the last of the islands. So we can see here a pretty distinct um, uh, profile of two sort of eras of exploration. But if we extend it into the 20th century, we see it all take off once again. Suddenly more islands are discovered than were known previously. So where did all these islands come from? Well, these are Pacific islands that have uh, subsided and eroded and are now uh, below the surface of the ocean. Uh, and there are a lot of them. So seamounts uh, are discovered because there are new methods of exploring uh, the Pacific. And there are new needs, even military needs, uh, because of the role of submarines. And in fact, one of our submarines a few years ago ran into one of these. Uh, 
either uh, an act of carelessness or they, they accidentally discovered a new one. So I look at this pattern and I've decided, does this make sense? Um, are there in fact three great waves of discovery? And I think that there are. And what I will be doing is to illustrate, uh, flesh this out, if you will, uh, looking at the different ways in which each of these eras of discovering Pacific Islands aligns with other things going on uh, in Western civilization at the time. One of the arguments here is that exploration is, is not just a random process. Uh, it is a cultural creation like institutions or works of art uh, uh, or architecture. Uh, each of these eras has its own geographic realm where it concentrated particularly each connects with certain larger intellectual cultural movements. Uh, each has a, a rivalry uh, that without some sort of competition, uh, this doesn't go very far. Each has its own sort of characteristic moral drama. There is something about an encounter that creates, uh, that forces people into choice, uh, that brings us into a kind of moral world as well. And each has its distinctive gestures um, and one grand gesture that seems to summarize what it's about. So in this case, the graph uh, is a little different. It's showing number of expeditions. And uh, this, this can be uh, argued over. And it's not weighted in any way, how, which, which uh, a more sophisticated approach would require. But nonetheless, I think it shows a very interesting trend. And each of these eras has its own, uh, oh, its own profile. Uh, first was primarily by sea, the discovery of the world ocean, although there were great, uh, some great interior uh, entradas. Uh, the second age is primarily concerned with natural history, with uh, continents, and the great era of land expeditions. And then when we get to a third age, we're looking at the source of discovery for the, all those deep ocean islands, but we're also looking at space and we're looking at Antarctica as a kind of transition point between areas. So let me sort of uh, develop this a bit more. When it began, um, Europe was not a major player in the world. This is a, sort of typically how we look at a world globe today, a flat map. And uh, usefully Europe is pretty close to the center. But if we dial it back 600 years, we would have a very different view. And uh, here the Pacific is um, lamentably uh, shrunk, but it shows the distribution of land. And Europe is pretty much where it was historically at that time, at the perimeter of a large land mass, a series of uh, peninsulas shrinking into islands, uh, pretty much at the edge of the world. And even though most peoples will put themselves at the center of their maps of the world, Europe's did not, even going back to Ptolemy's great map from uh, uh, Roman times, synthesizing the known world, Europe is on the margins. And the center, of course, was the Holy Land. Uh, this is really an unusual practice. Uh, almost all other maps of people, of course, they are at the center and everything radiates out. So Europe, even here, uh, in, in its own conception of the world, was somehow marginal. But what we will see is that those maps will change. So how did, how did this come about? Well, a series of things fed into it, a series of pushes and pulls. Uh, there are a lot of rivalries, a lot of competition, political, economic, religious, especially after the uh, Counter-Reformation, but also before that with the Crusades and then eventually uh, scientific as well. Uh, there were lots of agents operating. Uh, mostly there had to be some kind of government sanction because having uh, your citizens or, um, or other emissaries from, from your state uh, doing things around the world eventually brings you into conflict with other states. And so governments at some point have to be involved. Uh, but there were lots of private companies, some of them chartered, some not. Uh, there would be lots of alliances with indigenous people, many of whom were far more sophisticated than Europe at the time. And there were, a lot, there were, of course, random individuals and freebooters and so forth 
uh, coming into play. So it's a, a kind of a swarm, particularly as we get further on. And there were lots of attractions, uh, always the, the lust for gold uh, and loot of some kind, but also exhaustion. Uh, you fished out uh, the near oceans. You've eaten out the pastures for your flocks. You have to go someplace else and find. So there were lots of things going on, and they got organized. And as this develops and grows in strength, uh, exploration as such conflates with lots of other things as well, including um, conquest, imperialism, colonization, and so forth. But they actually are distinctive. What Europe wanted originally was trade. It wanted wealth. It was not looking to create new colonies as such. It was happy to rule over uh, existing peoples. But here's Vargas Machuca, uh, sort of the second wave of, uh, of conquistadors uh, in Spanish America, uh, putting it very simply by the sword and the compass more and more and more and more. So there was more and more and more to be learned, but there was also more and more uh, of, if you will, the dark side of exploration and content. So let's <coughs> look at how this early great age of discovery developed. Uh, this is a map, actually, it's designed for uh, earthquakes, but it shows the world at sea very nicely. And that, that's why I like it, because the, the greatest discovery of the first age was that uh, all the world's oceans were joined. Uh, not true in Ptolemy's uh, map or co early conceptions, but basically you could put in at any part of the world ocean, you could reach any other part. So the search for all those different seas and the passages between them uh, was the great achievement, I think, of the first age. The intellectual context was a renaissance, literally a rebirth of knowledge. Uh, it was overly obsessed with in the beginning with finding, uh, recovering ancient knowledge, uh, uh, overly um, deferential uh, to antiquity uh, in the texts that had been recovered and translated. But here we have Francis Bacon in 1620 using the idea of new lands being discovered as a way of arguing for new, new kinds of knowledge and new ways of learning. So what we have here is a ship and a voyage of discovering sailing past those two uh, columns, which represent the pillars of Hercules, that is to say the Western uh, borders of the Mediterranean. So in a sense, the borders of antiquity, in this case, arguing that we are going to sail beyond them into new realms of learning, that we would not only discover new lands, but we would discover whole new realms of understanding new worlds uh, of knowledge. So in late medieval uh, period, uh, dominated by texts, uh, reading from the ancients, uh, demonstrating, uh, adding to it, writing it down, lecturing, or in the bottom, uh, Jerome translate. Huge effort at translation, uh, and that would be extended. But we're beginning in the Renaissance, as it, as it matures, to move into something else interested in naturalism, uh, interested in actually learning the facts, not as they're recorded in Galen, but as they're recorded in cadavers, um, and finding ways to introduce mathematics uh, to frame. Um, so even in pictures, uh, mathematical perspective becomes a way of organizing uh, visuals that was not true before. So this is going to be the background um, for these discoveries. Rivalry. Uh, why is someone going to bother? Uh, you, you may be pushed and pulled, but uh, unless you've got someone else who threatens to get there first, a lot of times uh, nothing, nothing further happens. It was a, essentially dynastic rivalries in Iberia uh, between Spain and Portugal. Uh, between them, they, they really uh, accomplished most of the task. Everybody else were, were minor players and eventually as Spain and Portugal exhaust themselves and overreach themselves, others become, uh, began interloping and poaching on it. Um, and the Portuguese in particular really created the paradigm, if you will, for exploration and managed to institutionalize it. I mean, Europe had expanded and contracted over and again uh, for a very long time, but this time it kept going. And we have to ask why. And one reason was the nature of the way exploration and discovery got into 
constitution was got affiliated with and, and uh, entangled with the larger society. So the Portuguese paradigm, uh, there's Luis uh, de Camones, the, the great um, literary figure of Portugal producing its, its epic, uh, arguing that had there been more of the world, they would have discovered it. And they, they managed to, that we know of, get five of the seven continents uh, and very probably the sixth. Uh, only Antarctica uh, was spared. Um, prince Henry, uh, really more of a medieval prince than a, a visionary of modernity, uh, but nonetheless, he set them on their way, voyaging out into Atlantic islands, colonizing those, and then moving down the coast of Africa. Uh, and then the classic trilogy of motives, God, gold, and glory. Uh, St. Francis Xavier, founder of the Jesuits, um, establishing essentially a missionary order uh, to uh, journey uh, to um, the empire of the East. Gold, Vasco da Gama, a three-time governor of, of the empire out of Goa in India. Um, the political administrator, viceroy, if you will, but also a trader merchant. Uh, Portugal was interested in traffic, particularly in, in spices. And glory, uh, the, the military component, which was absolutely essential because they would never have gotten very far without it. Uh, Albuquerque, Kirky noting all of the choke points and the great uh, seaborne traffic of the Indian Ocean elsewhere, and then identifying those, uh, seizing them, and in effect creating um, a, fort a fortified um, a stronghold for. Uh, for the Portuguese Empire, and then converting that into literature, into uh, larger, in this case, higher culture, his uh, Camones, uh, who had himself uh, ventured uh, to the East and later came back and wrote the great epic model on the uh, Homeric ethics of, of um, antiquity, but then updating it that these were, these were the new uh, uh, Ulysses and um, Aeneas's uh, of the modern time. So what's fascinating here is that one, how fully the entire society is engaged. And it's, and it's estimated that as much as 10% or more of Portuguese population was involved. So it was with the overseas uh, traffic. Um, but also the way in which it offered the kind of a complete intellectual spectrum in the same way that it, it offered uh, an entire trading empire. Uh, that would then provide, in a sense, the basis for others. They managed to go everywhere. It's really astonishing. Once they got going, particularly uh, after they landed the Cape of Good Hope in 1488 in Southern Africa. So it opened uh, the possibilities of getting into the Indian Ocean. Uh, and then from that time on, they were North America, discovered Brazil, uh, South America. Uh, by uh, 1543, they, they had made it to Japan for heaven's sakes. Uh, and it's, it's very likely that they knew about, if not actually visited Australia as well. So it's a, an extraordinary outrush in essentially one or two generations had done it. And this seems to be typical. There's, there's a great pioneering generation and a kind of golden age then it quickly followed by a second silver age and then, and then it falls apart. Grand gesture, well, it's clearly a circumnavigation if the world sea uh, is uh, is the object of inquiry being able to circle, encircle the world on the sea uh, is, is taken as a great gesture. Magellan, uh, voyage achieved it. Magellan himself doesn't make it. He died uh, stupidly in a, an unnecessary uh, fight in, in the Philippines. But the Victoria made it around and even in that age was taken uh, and honored as a, an extraordinary event. And the moral drama? Europe is having to encounter all kinds, oops, excuse me, all kinds of people um, it had no, not known about, people who were not part of uh, uh, Herodotus or Strabo's geographies, uh, people who were not part of their own uh, experience uh, of the world, people who were not uh, listed in the Bible, uh, who were not in the records of antiquity and having to deal with this, having to understand and work out some sort of negotiation 
with all these new people um, creates a kind of moral as well as political and legal uh, tension. We're so accustomed now to think about science bonded to exploration. Um, it really isn't true at this time. There's certainly an intellectual component, um, but not at all is what we think of as modern science, which hadn't been invented. So I don't want to throw a lot of dates at you, but those on the left are sort of some of the key dates in uh, Portugal's expansion and a few of uh, Spain's uh, in the New World. Uh, and uh, science on the right. So 1453, Constantinople falls. Uh, it's a diaspora of scholars and texts. Uh, that helps to uh, give a new boost to uh, an Enlightenment project, but Copernicus publishes his uh, uh, study of um, the solar system, putting the sun at the center in 1543. Portuguese had already reached Japan by this point. By the time Galileo invents the telescope, 1609, uh, we're 37 years after Camones had published his epic, sort of summarizing uh, the Portuguese achievement. Um, we're, we're, we've got a century or more afterwards uh, for Newton to publish Principia Mathematica and then another, what, uh, nearly 20 years before he publishes his work on the optics, the two of the foundation books for, uh, for uh, modern science. So all of this happened in the absence of science. Uh, science developed on a parallel track. The Gama was dead 30 years before Galileo was born. Portuguese empire was already in decline by the time Galileo uh, begins publishing. So the first stage of discovery is also uh, becoming a bit more of it. Uh, it had set out to find new ways to connect to known parts of the world. It, it, what, whatever it had known about the East, uh, it wanted to tap into that wealth um, and it wanted to find a new way to do it. Uh, the Great Voyages uh, were means to do that. Along the way, they discovered whole new continents. They discovered new oceans. They discovered peoples and empires that they had no idea about. But once that had been done, um, there's no reason to continue to explore. In a sense, they, they had found that the world was a great patchwork of, of seas and straits and passages uh, across and between them. So we can think about them creating a kind of quilt uh, with the seas as patches and the voyages as stitches. And once that was done, uh, exploration settles down to trade. Uh, and effectively, uh, the number of expeditions, the number of new islands, uh, the whole process begins winding down. In fact, by the early 18th century, when as we've seen, there were very few new islands being discovered in the Pacific and those accidentally, uh, if anything, there's a kind of uh, rebellion against it, a pushback. Um, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels are the best known, uh, deeply satirical, almost bitterly so, about European discovery and what the consequences are. Uh, Samuel Johnson weighs in with his um, novel of Rasselas and points it was pointless to go adventuring. Everything you need to know was right at home. And while we think of Robinson Crusoe today as kind of a celebration of a man in the wilderness, a survivor, great uh, adventure and explorer, if you read the original, I, I think you get something quite different. And a passage where uh, Crusoe, having had several misadventures by sea, uh, was contemplating his last one, uh, was called by his father and uh, told that, you know, it's for men of desperate fortunes or of aspiring superior fortunes who went abroad for adventures to rise by enterprise and make themselves famous. And the middling way was the best. And uh, Crusoe says that uh, he had in the future many occasions uh, to recognize the prophetic nature of his father's warning. So it's a very different story uh, at the time than we see it now. But we know that exploration didn't end. In fact, uh, it picks up again. Um, and becomes what uh, William Getzman once called a second great age of discovery. Uh, different players, different purposes, uh, but building on uh, the old terms. And part of it is that this is really the enlightenment uh, in the larger term, uh, beginning to explore. 
uh, science uh, is coming to uh, wield influence throughout all aspects of Western society. There's an immense process of secularization going. So the sextant replaces the cross and naturalists replace missionaries. And here we have a, a Charles Wilson Peale's famous painting of his museum in Philadelphia, Natural History Museum, pulling back the curtains of darkness and ignorance and exposing um, a world of learning to light. And then this, in a sense, becomes the symbol um, of the Enlightenment and, and the Enlightenment as a vehicle for inspiring exploration. Uh, another great painting of Humboldt in uh, Ecuador, Mount Chimborazo in the background. And we see again, here he is, the European with his instruments of science, uh, bringing enlightenment, illuminating the landscape uh, uh, to, the, to the local peoples. So how did this happen? Well, a couple of things, a bunch of things come together somewhat accidentally. One is uh, interest in the transits of Venus, which occurred uh, twice in um, the 1760s. And each time uh, an international science uh, campaign was organized to map it. And this mattered because um, thanks to the work of, of uh, Kepler and others, they understood the relative ratio of orbits of, of planets around the sun, but they didn't know the absolute distances. Uh, but if they could watch the movement of Venus as it crosses the sun, uh, then they, that could give them a chance by a parallax triangulation to, to estimate that distance. So it was done twice. It was a very unusual event, opportunity. Uh, even the first one was even done in the midst of the Seven Years' War uh, between uh, Britain and uh, France. And in effect, they have to outfit the voyage of discovery uh, to conduct science. This is quite an extraordinary change from what had gone on in the first stage. There's also a concern about, um, again, our, our conception of cosmology uh, that the Enlightenment was putting together, how, how the planets look and operate, how important um, forces like gravity uh, manifest themselves. And there were two primary competing theories of gravity. One suggested that the Earth would be flattened at the poles and widened uh, at the equator. The other suggested just the opposite. And there was a way to test this if you could measure arcs of uh, the meridian longitude uh, at polar areas and at the equator. So again, expeditions were mounted to do this. Uh, one to Ecuador, the French were the primary leaders in this. Um, and another to uh, the northern part of the um, Baltic Sea uh, through Lapland. And uh, as a result, uh, Newton's theory of gravity was, uh, was confirmed. At the same time, uh, natural history, as opposed to what was then called natural philosophy, uh, is coming into prominence. And here's one of the great uh, symbols of it, uh, Carl Linnaeus. Um, here, outfitted sort of combining the exotic and the enlightened. Here he is in his uh, uh, travels into uh, Lapland at the time among the Sami, uh, dressed up, coming back in costume. Uh, how often do we see explorers doing this? In this case, costume is a, is a Sami shaman, uh, but at the same time holding uh, plants, uh, bringing his own instruments, then recording them in a book. In effect, uh, uh, an herbarium. Of, uh, of plants from the region. Linnaeus then did this six other times uh, commissioned by uh, the Swedish monarchy to explore what the kingdom held. So these were a series of sort of small cross sections, natural history excursions. And then he later settled down at, at Uppsala in his garden and uh, had many uh, visitors and trained 12 uh, students that became known as his apostles uh, to do the same, and they did it uh, on a global scale, um, taking uh, commercial uh, ships, in some cases uh, finding ways to, to travel, um, and doing the same thing as Linnaeus did. Uh, six of the apostles died on their, on their travels, uh, some early, early kinds of martyrs to science, as we think about secularizing the process. So natural history is getting involved, but what about uh, other forms of elites, uh, particularly in Britain, the state of the 
uh, English university was so dismal at the time that uh, aristocratic families organized for their sons to uh, uh, be educated on, on a grand tour of the continent, going especially back to places of art and antiquity. They had their own entourage, their own tutors, their own uh, servants, um, what became known as the grand tour. But this also brought people who carried artists with them, what, what they were trying to draw, but they were also carried artists to record uh, their travels, their experience. And so we began seeing uh, artists being involved and in art uh, being engaged as well. And then it finally sort of comes together towards the latter part of the latter half of the 18th century. Here's James Cook, the first of his three great voyages around the world, a new era of circumnavigation, and this time uh, outfitted with science uh, as well as other purposes. Joseph Banks, um, wealthy aristocrat, um, naturalist, uh, announced uh, any, you know, any blockhead can do a grand tour. His would be a voyage around the world. And so he uh, managed to equip part of uh, uh, the Endeavor Cook ship uh, as a laboratory. Uh, he traveled with other naturalists here, one of uh, Linnaeus's apostles. Uh, he brought artists. This is the uh, second, this is actually John Cook's second voyage, William Hodges uh, going to Tahiti. And Cook's voyage was organized to go to Tahiti, which had just been discovered, and set up uh, an observe an observation post for the trans second transit of Venus. So you can see all these things sort of coming together uh, in a useful way. Uh, Cook is often uh, suggested as the model for James Kirk of Star Trek fame. And I thought it would be fun to consider uh, Cook's away team. Who, who was a party? Well, the captain, the chief science officer, the doctor. Uh, typically, they would have an armed escort and if necessary, an interpreter. So pretty much the same things we see transported at warp drive uh, into the 20th century and beyond. Cook, of course, dies in Hawaii on his third voyage, a misunderstanding, a lethal misunderstanding with uh, the natives still argued about. But here his death is represented in art as a kind of assumption, as a kind of secular martyrdom uh, attended by Minerva in Britannia. Uh, so we can see uh, the shift from the first age to the second illustrated very nicely here. But the man who more than anyone uh, came to epitomize the era is Alexander von Humboldt, one of the great uh, figures of his time. What, you know, what Napoleon was to the politics of the era and, and Beethoven was to the music, Humboldt was to its science. Here was the explorer, was romantic hero. He was uh, lionized as a second Columbus. Uh, he uh, spent five years uh, traveling through uh, Spanish America, uh, writing about it uh, in, and spending his fortune and most of his life uh, producing this, uh, I think it's 54 volume uh, study complete with plates and everything else, a whole natural history inventory in a sense of, of the continent of the new world. He was also one of the most painted figures of the year and it just, it just endless, the marvelous, Images of Humboldt, here he looking a little like a, a young Marlon Brando, slouching from his labors uh, in, in the uh, rainforests of uh, Venezuela, uh, with, uh, again, with his instruments, uh, nature, trying to, trying to bring order uh, as the Enlightenment understood it to, uh, to nature. And as I mentioned before, Mount Chimborazo, he did reach the top, but he reached pretty far up and set up a, a a height, a, a record for uh, elevation for climbing. And that became a symbol uh, for him and uh, for all those who, who understood his own achievement to sort of reaching, reaching new heights. Uh, he, was, of course, was an inspiration for uh, many of the great naturalists of the 19th century, uh, Darwin and Wallace, the co-discoverers of evolution by natural selection, both read Humboldt and were inspired by him. It's one of Humboldt's uh, personal narrative is one of three books Darwin uh, carried with him on his own uh, voyage around the world. And he influenced artists. Uh, landscape art comes into vogue in ways that it had not been present before. Here's the American Frederick Church, student of uh, Thomas Cole, early landscape artist, 
reading Humboldt, going to South America to try to paint in these enormous canvases uh, something of the visions that uh, Humboldt had evoked. And here turning some of these scenes to uh, political and social commentary. Uh, Humboldt uh, witnessed an explosion in Mount Cotopaxi as he was leaving by ship. Uh, and this is Church's rendition of it. And we can see a war in nature between the forces of dark, darkness and light. And in fact, this was done in the midst of the American Civil War and sold um, for Union war bonds. So we can see the way in which explorers and images they bring back uh, become embedded and speak to the society in ways uh, um, that even today are, we, we've, are no longer true. The popularity of travel and exploration was huge at the time. In fact, as the United States was expanding antebellum US, it's estimated that as much as a quarter of the federal budget was devoted uh, to exploration of one kind or another. And partly you simply need to know what the new lands are. And for these uh, settler societies, uh, places where European immigration uh, would in effect take over uh, countries, uh, the explorer becomes a kind of Moses figure, a, a guide, an honored guide to promised lands, or in later times, perhaps uh, a symbol of, of what was wrong. Uh, but one way or the other, the explorer was, was critical to the process. So. Adding up the second realm, what's the geographic focus? Well, there was plenty of ocean traffic. I mean, think Darwin, for example. But the continents were, were really the, the core um, source. Uh, the intellectual context, the greater enlightenment and all of its, its influences. Science now becomes a dominant presence. It's unthinkable to mount a serious expedition without a naturalist or a dedicated scientific component. The rivalry. What sends Cook uh, and others into the Pacific and around the world? France and uh, Britain are engaged in a long series of wars for supremacy, the Seven Years' War, uh, sort of beginning the Napoleonic Wars, uh, continuing it, a, a new Hundred Years' War, really. Um, and that will, become, uh, that will become the primary driver. And this is a, a great graphic uh, that was produced by a guy. You can see the number of, of expeditions. These were of a particular kind, not all, not all kinds of uh, surveys, but you can see the relative shift among different countries where it is. And you can see that there's a gap, France sort of fills it, and then Britain picks up the rivalry, and then Britain sort of takes on everyone else. And as uh, settler societies are created, like Australia, uh, Canada, the United States, they become exploring nations in their part. Grand gesture, I would think of Continental Traverse. Humboldt's is the, um, the most famous globally, but clearly in the US, Lewis and Clark. Um, Humboldt, on his return to Europe, dined with Thomas Jefferson a month before uh, Lewis and Clark set off from St. Louis on their own expedition. So one can see a kind of uh, transfer of enthusiasms. And the moral drama, well, these neo-Europes, as Alfred Crosby called them, these, these new settler societies uh, are themselves expanding. What, what is their story? How does exploration fit into it? What is the nature of their encounters with local peoples and so forth? A very rich source of, of literature um, and politics, legal, uh, debate and so forth. Well, I think the second age finally ends in Antarctica. It really went beyond the limits of what, what their art and science and politics and technologies could do. Uh, the ice sort of reduces the whole thing to, to ultimately to stories of survival, even individual survival. Uh, the ice strips everything. I mean, the whole continent is reduced basically to one mineral. Uh, and the second age and its intellectual and, and technological apparatus were simply not able to cope. Modernism, which I'll take as sort of the larger intellectual syndrome that comes to replace the Enlightenment, begins disaggregating all of the features that had been brought together in the second age. Uh, here's a Thomas Moran um, woodcut for uh, John Wesley Powell's account traveling through the Grand Canyon by boat on the Colorado River. Uh, and there's a Moran uh, 
uh, color. It's a wonderful sort of transcendentalist opera of uh, landscape. Uh, but when we come into the modern age, maybe Duchamp's nude descending, descending staircase or Georgia O'Keeffe's visions of the Southwest, this is a very different vision of art and our relationship to the world. And it's not one that's particularly suited for exploration. So we're seeing that all these things that had converged uh, are, are going to start, start unwinding. Uh, there's very little new science that can be done at the time um, by exploration. It starts up again. So we have another sort of dead period, two world wars, a depression. I mean, there's a lot to preoccupy Europe uh, without trying to find new places, which are becoming harder and harder to find anyway. I think it starts up again uh, in the post-war era, uh, the International Geophysical Year, actually went 18 months. Um, pretty much announces what the new uh, realm of, of exploration will be. It will be uh, the ice of Antarctica. IGY began as a polar year to focus on Antarctica and then expanded beyond that. It will also bring together a lot of the stuff from the deep oceans, and it will bring together uh, stuff in space. In fact, the earliest uh, satellites, uh, Sputnik and Explorer 1, were both launched within the context of IGY. So I think at this point, we're announcing a third era. Very different one. Again, Antarctica's transition, here's Humboldt, uh, back in the midst of all this biological splendor. Uh, here's the ice. Uh, re the Earth reduced to a, a, an absolute minimum and the kind of art that would be appropriate to it, a very different uh, set of conditions. So Antarctica is a kind of transition. How are we going to explore uninhabited places, places that have no people, that could have no indigenous societies because there's no way to live off of that, then carry that down into the deep oceans where you're going to have to rely on robots and other kinds of machines uh, to visit. Uh, although there are marvels to be discovered, whole new realm, whole new ecosystems and biotas. And then of course, into space, uh, going beyond the earth moon system throughout the solar system. Again, in this case, uh, you're going to have to do it by robots. So the geographic realm of the third age, uh, it's the solar system. Uh, beginning with sort of the Earth Moon and the way that the first age began with the Baltic and Mediterranean seas of Europe and then expanded to a world ocean, or uh, the exploration of Europe by science and becomes the model for exploring continents elsewhere. Modernism will provide an intellectual context, but one that sits very uneasily. Uh, I, very few modernists. Uh, painters, artists, uh, literary figures are interested in exploring, and exploration does not seem well suited to bring such people. Rivalry, well, it's clearly the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union, uh, in many forms, exploration became a way of carrying uh, that competition out throughout the solar system, actually, uh, without actually uh, blowing each other up. The grand, grand gesture, Hey, I'm going to vote for Voyager, the traverse across the solar system. You know, as one guy put it, you only discover uh, the solar system for the first time once, and Voyager did it. Uh, and that's true. Uh, Voyager did not include Pluto, but by the time uh, Voyager uh, was in a position to, Pluto was being demoted out of it. So we, we can play games, but essentially, Voyager. Uh, I think became uh, the grand gesture of our time. And then the moral drama. Here's where another part where it gets interesting along with the cultural side. We're talking about the expansion of humanity, just people. Uh, and much of it's going to be done through proxies. People can't go uh, to these places. You can't live in these places. You're not going to encounter other people. And then many of them, you're not even going to encounter other life forms. What does it mean? And what is, where, is the, where is the moral drama? Where is the tension? 
for all of the awfulness that a lot of European ex exploration wrought on the explorers, as well as uh, people encountered, uh, there is a great there is a great tension there. That's a possibility of great interest, human drama, uh, and character, and so forth. Where is it when we start landing robots on Mars or beyond? So let me compare uh, great ages. Uh, part of the problem of our time, I think, is matching the software or cultural uh, system for understanding to our capacity to visit these places. Uh, the first age, uh, looking out, the invention of the telescope, you're looking and beginning to map the moon. Uh, the third age, looking back. In many ways, we're talking to ourselves. Uh, we're having to look back uh, on ourselves in a self-reflexive way that seems very much a part of modernism, but very alien to exploration as we had understood it before. Here's Franz Boas at Baffin Island, uh, uh, trying to understand a, a different culture, dressing uh, accordingly, uh, trying to absorb and understand and then translate. And here's Curiosity taking a selfie on Mars. These are very different kinds of intellectual and cultural circumstances. So here's Humboldt reconciling the flower with learning, uh, science and romanticism. Here's Ben Sean's Blind Botanist, a modernist rendition that has sort of silly grin, smirk on his face, doesn't sort of get the irony of it. Um, images from a Hubble telescope uh, and uh, Joseph Albert's abstract expressionism. Images of Jupiter, this great red spot, matched with other uh, expressionist paintings. Um, other images uh, of galaxies and uh, Albert Ryder's. Um, here are some X-ray images of uh, galaxies and Georgia O'Keeffe abstractions. Uh, false color imaging of the rings of Saturn to highlight the character, uh, Barnett Newman uh, paintings. Uh, and how about some more Hubble images? Uh, there's a, they really are great, aren't they? And here's uh, J Jackson Pollock's uh, action paintings. These are not images that really fit the landscape art and sensibilities that we associate, say, with the second great age. Uh, but they do match up pretty well with a kind of modernist sensibility or a a photograph of Antarctica, here the only mark on the surface of the ice is the shadow of the contrail of the plane, uh, matching up with another Newman painting. Here's a photograph, um, well, uh, yeah, we'll call it a photograph from the Viking uh, mission to Mars and uh, George O'Keefe, uh, New Mexico uh, summit. So the changing nature of encounter really gets to the core. Why, why do we care? What, what, what is at stake? Uh, how is exploration similar to what had gone on before and yet different? So here's uh, uh, one of uh, Howard Pyle's great uh, paintings to accompany Robinson Crusoe. Here he is discovering another person, the footprint of someone other, a human other on his island. And here we have uh, Aldrin and Armstrong on the moon taking a photo of their own footprint. Or Viking taking a, a photograph of its mechanical footpath on Mars. So in some ways, it's the same sense looking at an, an, an other. But what happens when the other is the self? or when the self is essentially a mechanical prosthesis uh, of ourselves. And sometimes this can lead to odd effects. Here, we're back with Humboldt and uh, Mount Chimborazo, the radiant Mount Chimborazo in the background. Here's a Chimborazo equivalent. This is along the Colorado River in the Mojave Desert, believe it or not. I defy anyone to actually find it. But this was painted as part of, uh, an expedition uh, by the Army uh, Topographical Engineers 
included a, a, a Henrik Mulhausen, uh, who uh, had, had met Humboldt and come with uh, Humboldt's uh, blessing and wanted to establish that his expedition to the American West was uh, Humboldtian in its scope and ambitions. So the way you do that is to put it much a barrazo within. Mulhausen later went back and wrote sort of westerns the, the, in a romance novel sense, the American West, and did and did very well uh, by it. And here we have a NASA um, rendition of human explorers on Mars. And what do we see? Well, it looks like Machu Picchu has been transported uh, to the Red Planet, establishing, in a sense, the, the similar character through the art of the expeditions. And finally, uh, the coup de grace. Uh, this is an image produced from a microwave uh, cartography of Venus. And Venus in general is a very level area, not known for great um, mountain ranges and gorges and so forth. And uh, there it is. It's the same thing. Well, this image was criticized pretty soundly in the community because it exaggerated vertical dimensions 20 times in order to create the effect. But I think what either deliberately or sub, more likely subconsciously, what they are trying to do is to create uh, equivalence that this is, again, is in a tradition that we recognize and deserves to be recognized, even if people aren't in the scene. Um, we're experiencing, we're encountering, if you will, the same kind of physical geography. So where's expedi where, where are we going with all this? Uh, sort of a case of identifying continuities and discontinuities and making the proper kinds of analogies so that we, we can be productive and not silly. Um, the driving rivalry. Well, Europe is no longer squabbling among itself and sending out expeditions as a way of exporting those competitions. It's, it's integrated. Uh, with the end of the Cold War, that has deprived Third Age exploration of, of its driving force. We'll have to see if others enter the competition or not. Uh, exploration, science, and colonization had all come together in the Second Age, uh, and now they've they're pretty much separate. We can have exploration as its own activity. Science, we can do science without, by sending up uh, orbiting telescopes. We don't have to send spacecraft. Um, we're certainly not going to colonize. And if we send human outposts as with Antarctica, I mean, we've been in Antarctica for over a century now. Uh, these tend to resemble the trading posts of the first age, not efforts to recolonize, not establishing new worlds um, to be populated, but but places um, to trade, in this case, maybe to trade information. Uh, and what does it mean? What is all character of exploration? What does encountering mean when you're dealing with robots, uh, when you're dealing with uh, conditions like these? Where are the cultural connections? How does the civilization of modernism or postmodernism, its various discontents, how does that align, support, or quarrel with um, exploration. So in many ways, we're, we're sort of going back more to a first age uh, era than the sec reviving the second age. And we need to face up to the, to the ambivalences of, of a quest narrative. I see exploration as a kind of institutionalized quest narrative for uh, Western Civ. Um, and it has also, it has produced all kinds, of, it has its dark side. And we're emphasizing more and more that. How, how does this feed into uh, the continuities? What, what might the future look like? So exploration, it's always a great read. I keep coming back to it. I began my doctoral dissertation. <laughs> I'm tempted to say back in the second age. Uh, it's been so long. Uh, biography studies in Antarctica, Grand Canyon Voyager. Uh, it's always a great read, and now I've, I'm trying in, in the great ages of discovery to consolidate all of this prior work, give it a kind of intellectual frame, and yet still capture some of the enthusiasm, uh, the zest, um, 
that exploration has always brought. So with that, let me oh, thank you for your attention and open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Stephen. We really appreciate that. And uh, we've got a question by, um, going to bring on, where did it go? Lawrence LaRousse. If, Lawrence, if you, I'm going to allow you to un unmute there and ask your question. Thank you. I did, uh, I did type it in the, in the uh, chat, but I was just wondering why exploration thing uh, the great Asian civilizations uh, discover us. You know, it's yeah. an interesting point. No, that's a great question. Uh, and I mean, there are lots, even if, if, if I'd had more time, uh, we could have opened up with Europe cited in a whole array of maritime cultures and civilizations, many of which were expanding. China had these great uh, treasure fleets that it was sending out in the early uh, 15th century. In fact, China may, I mean, we were within a few decades of China possibly rounding the Cape of Good Hope and meeting the, Europe, meeting the Portuguese on the other side. Uh, so why, why did that continue? I think part of it is that uh, China was able to muster an enormous um, resources in, at an imperial level to sponsor these fleets. But then when the uh, emperor changed, all those interests disappeared. What makes the European story, I think, special, why did Europe continue? It's because of this internal competition. We say Europe, but it wasn't Europe. It was a whole collection of squabbling states that were endlessly quarreling among themselves. So if Spain stumbles, Portuguese, Portugal is liable to move in. If Portugal stumbles, the Dutch are liable to take, as they did in the East. Uh, if the Dutch stall, the British will come. Uh, the French are, are marauding, along, patrolling along the edges. So there was a dynamic that was set into motion. So there was a lot, so much internal competition of various kinds that you could keep going. Although even there, as I've shown, there were periods where it stalls. And there's every reason to think it will end, just as the Viking uh, era of exploration might have ended. Uh, it did end. Uh, and it, it didn't, something else kept it going. And in a sense, it, it became a thing in itself, valued in and of itself. And so we can hardly imagine Western Civ now without being exploring. But lots of other people, just think of the Polynesians, for example, who were all over the Pacific. And much of what Europe did was to tap into existing networks of knowledge um, and maritime cultures and then uh, translate that knowledge. So it's essentially the, the Renaissance project of translation, in this case, geographically from other peoples. All right, our next question, Susanna Henry, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Susanna or Susanna. Hello, um, Dr. Pine, I really enjoyed your presentation. And I had a question that you mentioned one of the explorers in, I think, the second age. No, I'm sorry, the first age. Uh, I think you said da Gama died in a stupid fight in the Philippines. Could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, that was actually Ferdinand Magellan. Uh, and Magellan had managed to navigate his, his uh, I think at the time with the, the three ships, left, they made it to Guam uh, before they starved to death and then made it to the Philippines. And then um, it was sort of, you know, the best and the worst uh, of Europe at the time. Um, intensely uh, religious, uh, militant, um, acquisitive. They managed to, uh, they, they began converting uh, local people. Um, Magellan had a brief uh, episode as a kind of faith healer uh, which was great at inspiring people to uh, convert. And then he decided he would announce, which demonstrate the prowess of European force of arms and the need, the value of an alliance um, with the King of Spain, with the Spanish monarchy, uh, by identifying the traditional enemies of this particular group he was with and, um, and then fighting them. 
to show what they could do. And the whole thing was botched from the beginning. It was ill-conceived, it was ill-executed. Uh, the uh, party, most of the party died on the beaches. Uh, Magell Magellan himself uh, died in the surf. And then uh, the, uh, the, um, the remaining commanders uh, were able to uh, navigate their ships. So they lost one, then they lost the second. Uh, Portugal had set out to intercept uh, the ships and that happened. And then one ship eventually made it back, uh, limping back uh, into port. Um, so it was, it was a wholly unnecessary event. Um, the Philippines, Filipinos had no interest in watching this demonstration with Magellan uh, suddenly full of himself, losing the self-control that had been so vital to getting them that far uh, around the world. Uh, and then, so in a sense, some of the things that, that had made it possible for him to do what he did uh, went to excess and uh, turned against him. Our next question is uh, from Pat Patricia Brown. If you'd like to t unmute yourself, Patricia. Are you there? Patricia? I will. Um... Oh, I can see. I can see. Look, I've got her chat. Let me see if I can answer it. She basically. Uh, is asking about exploration of sport, tourism, and the new role of women. Uh, exploration can mean lots of things. For me, uh, I think it, it has to have an intellectual or cultural component to be, it, and it has to have a journey of some sort. So simply doing science is not exploration uh, in this sense. Neither is simply uh, adventure, uh, doing extreme sports of one kind or another uh, without Without a without a deeper connection, so that's somewhat of an arbitrary definition I have, but I, I'm willing to hold to it. Um, at some point, exploration yields to sort of normal science. Uh, it yields to uh, tourism. Uh, it yields to sort of uh, extreme sports. Uh, and when that transition occurs, is a matter of judgment. Uh, new role of women. Well, women have always been a part, but not a major part uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the great exploration stories of all time uh, concerns the French geodesic mission uh, to Ecuador, uh, which, which took about 35 years eventually for the entire expedition to uh, unwind and make itself back. But uh, uh, they, several of the members, uh, several died uh, several married into local society uh, in Quito, and one, uh, Isabella Godin, uh, was one married uh, cartographer. Uh, he went down uh, the Amazon to arrange for transport uh, to take them back to France, and then it just went on for years. She eventually sets out to find him. All of the members of her party including several of her brothers and others are all killed. She ends up wandering around the rainforest near uh, Quito and uh, is rescued by some of the indigenous. They, they get around. It's just an extraordinary story of survival and adventure. And it, it's a real classic. And it, was, it helped to galvanize 18th century interest. Most people didn't care about the shape of the earth uh, particularly, but they did care about the story of Isabella. And that's that's one of the great one of the great sagas. Our next question comes from Dick Wachter. Dick, if you'd like to unmute yourself. I'd like to thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, looking forward, this third age, uh, my question revolves around the search for natural resources that are running kind of low on this earth, or at least hard to, to extract. That seems to be a, some reason we search through the solar system. The Chinese have gone to the dark side of the moon, for example. What, what is your view on this? Uh, it's a great question. That's certainly the kind of thing that motivated uh, exploration in the past. Uh, I think the cost and difficulty of getting stuff 
uh, out of the asteroids or the dark side of the moon or somehow out of Mars if we can find it is so immense that uh, it, it has very little economic incentive compared with recycling and managing what we've got on Earth. Um, the likeliest source of competition is going to be in the deep oceans. Uh, and that, that's already heating up. And how that is going to play out, I don't know. Uh, there's still so much of the oceans, the deep oceans that have not been mapped. We have better maps of the world. So my sense is that that will probably not be enough for exploration. But I have a hard enough time understanding the past. And uh, I've learned not to make uh, longer range forecasts for the future. So. Our next question is uh, Donald Cullen. Donald, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Uh, my question is, why don't we include the uh, travels of man out of the African Rift Valley 200,000 years ago, exploring the world and finding better places to live? And where do the that, Polynesians fit in? Yeah, great questions. Uh, I mean, people have been moving around the planet uh, from the beginning. Um, there are certain people who would say, you know, it's simply in our genes, we're destined to, to explore, we're destined, our drive for curiosity, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things, uh, all those things could be. One could imagine an, another story of humanity and exploration that would uh, include all kinds of wanderings um, and travels. Um, I'm restricting mine um, to Europe. And I think uh, in some ways uh, you can criticize it as being uh, Eurocentric. And I, I completely admit to it. I'm interested in how this particular civilization engaged with exploration to learn about a bigger world. And I think, it, I think this group had special significance because their maps were the ones that everyone else uh, accepted. In some ways, once you produce a working map of the world, why, why does someone else need to do it again? Um, so uh, it, also, it also folds into my conception that exploration, this kind of exploration, is a cultural creation. And different societies are going to do it uh, at different times and places. And Europe's went on for a particularly long time. And I'm willing to, I, I'm interested in seeing how that happened. Uh, Polynesians had moved all over the Pacific for a very long period of time. Uh, there was a lot of maritime traffic all over the Indian Ocean. Um, the islands of the Caribbean uh, had been colonized uh, out of really series of, uh, of waves, migrations, uh, really following the Orinoco River out and around. Uh, there are all kinds of stuff. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm willing to call that exploration in the same way. So it, you can certainly fault me for the nature of my definition, but I'm trying to be to hold to, the, to that and extract some useful information rather than generalize it to the point where it simply means people wandering around the world. Because there are all kinds of travel stories. There are pilgrimages. There are trade stories. Um, I mean, the first person to make it around the world actually was uh, a slave that Magellan in his early years had picked up uh, in the Far East, um, you know, where was it, uh, I think Malacca, and then brought with him to Portugal and then carried around to, to um, the Philippines. It turns out that Enrique uh, had originally been enslaved from the Philippines. So he came back and they were able to actually communicate with the people. What, he, he could, the, the language uh, was such that, that he could communicate with the rest. So he actually was the first one to make it all the way around. So there are all kinds of ways we can, we can con configure uh, human movement and uh, curiosity and so forth. My sense is that exploration is a particular cultural creation as a kind of institution. Uh, as I've defined it, and that's really what I study. I don't study the rest of it. And somebody else could, could
could very easily take that larger view. Um, All right, we have kind of a follow up to that. It looks like Kathleen Reeve, if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. There you go. Okay, it, it's about um, who told who, what, when, I guess, period. A friend of mine said that the Vikings came to America, but they didn't tell anybody. And Columbus came and he went back and told everybody. And so he gets credit for, quote, discovering America because he told, he informed, but it sounds like the Europeans were really eager to spread the word of their discoveries. Yeah, good question. Um... I mean, as I say, even in Europe, we, we have waves of out-migration and, and exploration, and then it collapses. Uh, the Canary Islands had been known in uh, Roman times as the, uh, uh, and then, then were forgotten and had to be uh, rediscovered many times. So uh, there was certainly interest uh, um, among the Europeans in these discoveries. There was a network of correspondence uh, and um, some of them, uh, just, just the whole network of the time. I mean, they didn't have uh, an internet or other sorts of systems. Uh, the um, the um, printing press was coming into its own as a way of spreading words, but most of them they were doing it by letters and correspondence and key, key players would spread the word, they would write letters. And so these things were circulating. But there was always a, a degree of uh, wariness. Uh, nations were interested in spreading the, the nature of their discovery in so much as they could then claim uh, possession of it or right to rule or right to trade. Over it. But a lot of stuff they were not interested in spreading because uh, they didn't want competition. So again, this was not a scientific world where uh, as soon as you you make your announcement, you want the whole, you want everybody to know it, and it's considered common property. These were trade secrets, and they were, Spain kept the records in its uh, uh, contract offices, uh, Contratacion, and the, the Portuguese kept it in their, their treasury. Um, and so these, these were not promoted, and so there's a lot of rediscovery. I mean, the Grand Canyon was discovered twice by Spaniards, beginning in 1540. Uh, at least twice that we know of, and then ignored and then had to be rediscovered in the middle of the uh, 19th century. Well, you've mentioned uh, several times that, uh, well, not several times, but you'd mentioned how you don't like to think about going forward, but back. And so uh, I, I know you mentioned the oceans and all of that, because I, I was thinking, what, what I was going to ask you, what's the fourth? But yeah. <laughs> but well, um, I think, you know, go ahead. Well, I think my sense is that most of Antarctica exploration, as we usually understand it, is done. Uh, not that we know everything, but that it's 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 yielded to an era of normal science. Uh, there may be places, or there's maybe some of the uh, ocean area under the ice uh, has yet to be discovered and so forth. Uh, I think the deep oceans are where the action is, uh, particularly the development of all kinds of submersibles, uh, robotic submersibles. Now they're getting a sort of core of discovery of submersibles where you can have all kinds of these things you now communicate with one another and, and map and spread. Uh, and it's, it's accessible, it's relatively cheap. There's a lot to be learned. That's where the action is. We still think of space because it's, it's so, we have such great literature of space and science fiction connected with space and so forth that we think of space as it, but I think space is really looks like the first age where you have a small number of expensive expeditions um, uh, launching. And if you have bases, they will be small ones. Uh, not a, we're not going to demographically take over the solar system and the rest. So I, I think a lot of these, the space exploration is going to end up going back to the first age and the character of the first age. Still great stuff. Uh, um, and I'm very happy with the robots. I like the robots. Uh, and I think the robots are getting better all the time and we're learning lots of stuff. Uh, I don't think we need to have people. The purpose for me is not to colonize Mars. The purpose is to, is to explore it. 
Um, but the oceans are clearly where the action is. So in looking at the past and all these wild explorations and discovery areas of discovery, what what is there one that's more compelling to you if you had a time machine and could go back, you would put yourself in? Oh, I, I feel most at home in the second age because it's 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 um, alien enough that to be different and fun, uh, but not so strange that I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know where I was. Uh, certainly Humboldt's expedition. I mean, Humboldt is, is such a great figure. And one of the reasons is that it, it was in a way non-political. Uh, he came, he was self-financed the, uh, you know, the Bourbon monarchy um, of Spain uh, was interested in learning more so about their colonies and were looking to uh, science to perhaps help advise them. And so he wrote a great book on, on Mexico, a uh, political essay on Mexico and its geopolitics uh, and economics. So that, but he was not the vanguard uh, of uh, conquerors uh, or colonizers. He was there as a, a sort of adventure in science. Uh, and almost every place he went had been visited. It was, it was already well known. It was inhabited. Uh, the Jesuits had already mapped uh, much of the Amazon. Um, and he, he was tapping into all kinds of local knowledge, but then he was doing what people at this time did. He was retranslating it into modern science as that science was rapidly uh, developing. I think that would have been probably the most fun, most fun period and the least, the least compromised. Uh, some of these others are, are great stories and so forth, but they lead uh, to all kinds of ugly events as well. So they bring out the best and the worst. And tell us, uh, you've got this great new book out, obviously, The Great Ages <laughs> of Discovery, which I'll give them the plug for, and we'll, we'll put another link uh, in, in your chat. Uh, for the link to that off the uh, U of A uh, press website and a discount they're offering there. But to, are you working on anything else for the future here? What's your next project? Well, the great ages of discovery uh, is a way of consolidating one of, one of the two major themes of my scholarly career. And that is exploration places, cultural engagement with them. Um, and the other great theme has been fire. And uh, I've, looking over the the scenes we're seeing in the last few years, I decided that we're really creating the fire equivalent of an ice age or what I've taken to call the pyrocene. And uh, so I've developed, uh, I have a short book, uh, The Pyrocene, uh, How This Happened, um, which uh, will be coming out in August, September of this year. Other than that, I'm trying to work on a fire history of Mexico, but it's going very slowly and uh, keep getting distracted by other projects. <laughs> well, we thank you very much for, again, sharing your passion with us and with our audience. And thanks to everybody from around uh, Tucson and much further out with our different folks from the Osher Network around the country for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next time, Stephen. So thank you so much for your time. Look forward to it. Well, thank you for the invitation. Have a good day. Everybody have a great week at Ollie and uh, we'll see you soon.